Welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show. Today, we're going to be looking at Take Two Interactive. So this one's been on the list for quite some time here. And uh, we're going to be taking a look at this company. We've looked at other video game companies in the past. Uh, the one that I've been involved with in more recently, as long as the channel has been alive, um, has been uh, Activision. So I have the video out there on my channel about Activision when I was started buying it. And of course, the day that I sold when it uh, was announced, they were going to be acquired by uh, Microsoft. I think that's a good video to watch to kind of as a case study at this point to kind of see what is the thought process behind when someone should probably think about selling an acquisition target. And it gets onto the annualized rate of return versus the absolute rate of return. And it's a good case study on that aspect and it was in real time so um, also there's you know i gotta say the activision videos have pretty funny intros um if you guys are into that okay so take two interactive is known for its grand theft auto series red dead redemption uh personally as a consumer i i am familiar with both of those products they're very good very well detailed they don't come out as often as other games and so a lot of you could say love goes into those games uh, the most recent one that's extremely popular and I think has broken tons of records is Grand Theft Auto. So taking a look, of course, at the um, stock itself, we're going to see how they performed thus far. And let me tell you right now, Take-Two Interactive as a, as a company has performed phenomenally since its IPO. Uh, but more recently, it's kind of actually been in a stagnant period. You can kind of see here since uh, 2020, it's kind of gone nowhere. And in fact, it's only down 10%. But over the one year, it's definitely it's down 19%. So it hasn't performed very well more recently. Now, the question is, was it overvalued? Did it get overvalued back then? And is that the cause of this? Suspicion says yes. So just before we even look at this, I think that's exactly what occurred. And this is a good a lesson that we can get trapped in what's called dead money. So even over the five years, right, you're still up, right? Let's see what the, the five-year return is 152%. I think that's outperformed the market. But more recently, again, we we're in this dead zone where you know the, the the company or the company has done well, but the stock hasn't done well, and that can happen when we reach a point of overpriced or overvalued. Okay, so when the stock was overvalued, and I assume it was right here in December, and a lot of things were overvalued. And 2021, at the very beginning of 2021, there was a huge liquidity boost uh, for a lot of these uh, meme stocks, you could say. And we, we saw that, you know, Take-Two Interactive actually did not benefit from that. Maybe a lot of liquidity left them. But at that point, I do believe they were overvalued. And then we again, we see that underperformance about down 28% while the market was up. Okay, not, not too good, right? So a lot of people, believe it or not, we're buying here because, you know, it continues to go up and they're like, oh, it's going to continue to go up. A lot of people don't understand the nuances or the details of what goes into the valuations of a business. So we're going to look at it today and decide for ourselves what we think about it. And of course, this channel is to provide a different perspective. Hope you guys enjoy this perspective. All right. So uh, let's look at the investor presentation. And this is going to be the sales pitch. If we don't like this, we're not going to really like anything else. Then we're going to look at the annual report and kind of see a little bit more details in terms of the balance sheet and stuff. Uh, so let's take a look here. Immersive Independence Mobile Milk Core. Okay. So this is the first time I'm reading this, by the way. I do this so that I am in a point of discovery alongside with you guys. So right here, we know that they own NBA 2K. That's kind of like a rinse and repeat. I never understood why people continue to buy those games, but I love the fact that they do for these businesses. So for example, EA has FIFA. The, they just repackage the same game, it seems, and change the graphics a little bit, maybe change the player stats a little bit, and then just throw it out there. And it's basically printing money every year. Same thing with uh, 2K. 2K is more or less the same thing. Uh, EA dominates almost every other aspect. Uh, and we have 2K and WWE, which more or less the same thing. So uh, Tiny Tina's Wonderland, I think that must be uh, Borderlands. Yeah, that's Borderlands. And then Marvel's Midnight Suns. Okay, so that's cool. Kerbal Space Program 2. Okay, I know they bought Kerbal Space Program. My brother was into that game. Uh, so independent, so they're, they're these are the ones that they are, um, uh, I think these are the ones that they're the publisher for. Then mobile games. So mobile as a, as a sector is a fast growing sector. It's the fastest growing sector of the video game market. And so it's important to see that they have exposure there. We know that, for example, Activision has King Digital and King Digital, I think is the largest in that space, but there are a ton of different mobile uh, video game developers. And so it's important to see that these larger developers are expanding into that avenue because there is a lot of money to be made there. Uh, Midcore and then new in terms of first play titles. Okay, so Kerbal Space Program, Theft Auto, the trilogy, the definitive edition. Okay, so these are like relaunches. 
All right, so pipeline definitions, independent. Okay, great that they define this for us. Externally developed. Okay, so it is that. They are the developer, sorry, but the publisher for those titles. And okay, so that, that's pretty much self-explanatory, the rest of it. Gap net revenue. Okay, so guidance. We, that's important for when we go to the model. Uh, net revenue, net revenue. Okay, cool. Okay, very short and sweet. I love it. You know what we didn't see here? Padding on the back. No padding on the back slides. Just here you go. I, I love it. There, there, this is indicative that the company isn't trying to sell itself. Very, very subtle, but very important note, okay? The company is not trying to sell itself to me, but this is the uh, earnings presentation, okay? So in this, I didn't see anything that says, look, you need to buy us, look how great we are. Look, look, look at me, I'm so amazing. I'm doing all these nice things. I didn't see any of that. I like to see that. All right. That doesn't mean it makes or breaks a stock for me, but it's something like a small little detail that I like to see. Okay. So now we're going to go into the uh, um, uh, annual report here. And first we're going to start with the income statement. So the income statement, it's not the 10 K this is the annual report. So it looks a little different, but we can see here and it, they do it by a percentage of revenue breakdown. So it's actually really nice. So I'll explain a little bit what this means. Let me zoom in for those of you who are on mobile. So we have the net revenue up here. And of course, net revenue is 100% of itself. So we have 100%. Then cost of goods sold is at 45%, right? So what this means is the cost of goods sold is at 45% of the revenue. So you can see you want this number to be going down, right? It basically means that the gross margins are going up. And then you go to gross profit, and this is your gross margins. Essentially, gross margins are going up. So an increase in gross margins is good to see. Uh, this is essentially somewhat of a software company but not, not necessarily. So, uh, they, cause they don't, they don't have recurring revenues. Like it's a, not a software subscription you buy, and then they continue to update the product. So this type of software is going to be lower margins. And then we have selling and marketing, all that jazz. Okay. So net income is what we want to go down to here. So we see an increase 12, 13, and an acceleration to 17. Well, what occurred here? Well, they probably had new titles, new titles released. And of course, Grand Theft Auto became a cash cow. Grand Theft Auto was released way back when, and it continues to produce income, not only from the sales, but from the actual aftermarket uh, purchases that players can make, such as you know money, you can buy money, or you can buy cosmetics and stuff like that. Uh, so that's the to their benefit. And then you have Red Dead Redemption as well, which is a similar business model. All right, now scrolling down to the balance sheet, uh, we can see here what we're going to try to visualize here is how healthy is the company. So cash and cash equivalents, we see it is increasing. Short-term investments increasing as well. Restricted cash cash equivalents is decreasing slightly. Not a concern at all, though. Uh, let's take a look down here. How much debt do they have? If I don't see a line item for debt, they have no debt. Current liabilities, total current liabilities, it should be in here, and I don't see one. So they don't have any debt. Very good. So very well-capitalized business. In terms of cash, they're going to have about two point something billion dollars because you add these two up because short term investments that could be like short term duration bonds. So you, we I would consider that as cash, uh, but it's not it's not exactly cash cash and cash equivalents is what you would consider the cash but I also consider short term investments somewhat as cash they are liquid and the balance sheet under gap uh, metrics it actually goes from most liquid uh, to least liquid so it's very easy I, I like that straightforward method methodology of organization. And then we're going to take a quick glance at the cash flows. So taking a look at the cash flows here, um, where let's take a look. And again, I haven't seen this before. So uh, software development cost licenses. Okay. So there we go. That's an, that's an actual cash expense. That's wasn't recorded before. Uh, and we have net cash. Okay. So nearly a billion. And so they are making more cash than they are reporting as net income. Great. So it look, it's going to be actually cheaper on a cash basis rather than a um, gap basis. So stock-based compensation. But I want to remind everyone that this is a real expense. Stock-based compensation is a real expense, even though that we're taking it out. Uh, it's not a cash expense, but it's a real expense. And then we will, we will actually recontribute that. It's very important that we actually recontribute that when we do our analysis. If we don't, we're going to make a mistake. We're, we're never going to get to the precise valuation if we don't do that. Um, you're going to get like a Frankenstein version of it. So deferred revenue, deferred costs of goods sold. Okay, cool. Uh, I think that's pretty much it. Purchases, long-term investments, purchases of fixed assets. They are not going to have much expenses at CapEx because they're, they're not that type of business. I'm trying to see if they actually have per repurchase shares. Yeah, repurchase of common stock. So they aren't actually buying back any shares except in one year. 
so that we do have a net dilution. That's what that tells me. We have a small amount of dilution. It's not that much, but you know, it is, um, well, actually, no, I take that back. That's a decent amount of stock-based compensation with no repurchase of common stock on the other end. They did do a big buyback in 2019, but they have suspended this buyback, it seems. All right, so that's something to think about. Uh, I don't know if they're going to continue it, but we're going to take a look at the model now. All right, so we're moving on to the model here. And again, it's zoomed in for those of you who are mobile. I try to remember because uh, I get comments sometimes and then I'm, I feel bad. <laughs> I try to do my best, guys. So TTWO, we type in that ticker. We'll wait for the model to load everything in. And uh, just pause. Do, 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 do. There we go. All right, so analysts have this at 187.8 implying a 27.8% uh, upside. Let's take a look over here. They'll pause here. You guys can look at that if you guys are care about this stuff. And I'll go back here. All right. So ignore all these growth rates. These growth rates are not applicable to this business. We'll get back to this in a second. And um, so taking a look at the other stuff, we have the PE, just as I suspected, the PE of 28, price to free cash flow of 20. So on a cash flow basis, it appears cheaper. Return on equity, 17.67. Uh, I had a question on the live stream. By the way, if you guys ever have any questions, you want to ask them live, try to tune into the live streams. I try to do a live stream. Uh, and this is a shameless plug, the first shameless plug of the channel. I do live streams every Tuesday and Friday, Friday or Saturday. And I try to have the guests on Friday and Saturday. So you can always ask guests questions or me questions. And then um, if I have a guest and then Tuesdays is just like a Q&A live stream gives everyone the chance to kind of confront me uh, or ask questions in general. And uh, it's kind of like more of a hangout. All right. So be sure to tune in on those live streams. And again, that's the best place to ask like a real world or um, in real time, a question. Uh, okay. So return on assets, but I had a question asking or pertaining to return on equity and return on invested capital. These are internal metrics of measuring the efficiency of a business, not to measure like your returns that you're going to receive. But that was a good question. It's, it's a good to explain that to people. So return on assets. Uh, inherently, this is going to be an asset light business. So I actually also uh, don't really care about that one too much. Uh, return on equity and return on invested capital are going to be more important. And they're very strong. So what that tells me is actually, I would prefer this business not to return capital to me at the present moment, uh, because a 24% ROIC compounded over long periods of time is actually very, very strong. So I prefer them to keep it. No dividends, don't give it to me. Uh, revenue estimates are actually down. Look at that. Uh, so analysts are actually expecting decline, but however, on cash flows, they expect uh, kind of to remain steady. And again, we see here, yep, the share is outstanding. They are a little bit dilutive. They did do a little bit of a buyback, um, uh, but not enough to actually make a dent in the overall picture. So they have had periods where they've bought back shares, but you know that's fine. Uh, whether where they are now, I wouldn't really think the buyback is appropriate. Remember that we also have to consider for buybacks, and I, I want to stress this point more and more because I see that um, maybe some people uh, don't know this, or at least this is my opinion. But I'll I'll hopefully share some light on that, and then you disagree or agree with this opinion. I think that uh, stocks or share buybacks should be executed well. And the only way that they're superior to dividends is if they're executed well. So dividends are, the, the benefit of a dividend is it's cash that's out. So you can experience the real value then and there. But a stock buyback has to be executed properly. Otherwise, it's actually shareholder destructive because that's the caveat of a share buyback. If it's executed poorly, i.e. when a stock is overvalued, then you're actually just better off burning the cash. Uh, or burning a portion of the cash. You won't, it doesn't lose the entirety of its value, but it loses the, a good portion of its value. And then we can look at other companies. There, there are plenty of companies that show examples of destructive share buybacks. Um, IBM is a good example. Uh, but basically, if, if you buy back your stock at overvalued prices, that's a poor use of shareholder capital. So here's kind of like a general rule of thumb. Look at a stock. If you think that it's overvalued and the company is doing share buybacks, that means in your opinion, in that scenario, you are disagreeing with management's decision implicitly, because if you think a stock is overvalued, then you don't want them to be giving, buying back shares, right? That's, that's you, if you get what I'm saying, the nuances of individualized opinions. So uh, that's a good rule of thumb that I kind of look for. I look at a company, I say, mm, this is overvalued. I don't want to be, them to be doing a buyback. In this instance, they're not doing a buyback. They're actually dilutive. So I think management is thinking about the longer term. They're not you know, giving a dang about the, the share price. And they're saying, they're probably saying our share shares are overvalued. We can get a lot of value by issuing the shares. In this case, paying employees 
Um, and then you get the added benefit of retaining talent. And if your stock or shares are overvalued, you're actually getting a lot of value out of them. And that's actually beneficial to the long-term shareholders. So the shareholders from way back when, if I was a shareholder from like 20 years ago, I wouldn't care. I'd be like, do what you need to do to make sure that the long-term story maintains itself. Of course, the new shareholders are going to are going to care <laughs> because they're they're more of a they just got in. All right. So you see, that's the added nuance again. If if you're like a long-term shareholder, I doubt you would really care too much about those shorter term fluctuations because you know you're already up a lot. Okay. So I'm kind of simplifying in that aspect, but let me know down below your, your thoughts. All right. So a company like this, again, very solid company. We see a share dilution of about 5%. So this is not going to like it. I'm going to tell you that right now. And uh, let's lower this discount rate to 12%. So we're not as aggressive. Uh, the growth rates though are pretty strong. So I'm going to say 20% on the high end. And you can kind of see right there, we're at a buy <laughs> at a 12% discount rate. So, so we're implying a 20% margin of safety above the market average. And uh, let's actually put in a 15% there, 18% uh, there. Uh, and then let's do a 10% there. Let's, let's start being aggressive in terms of how poorly they do. So you can kind of see here, and this is where I kind of say, take to interactive as a company I'd like to buy. Um, and you'll see in a second why, because I do think they're going to continue to grow. Grand Theft Auto 6 is going to be announced very soon. Um, so, you know, we, we are going to see some growth here in the future, but I think that around a hundred dollars a share is, is kind of where I'd be, I'd start getting interested in purchasing this company because it does allow me to continue estimating dilution for a while for, for every year, for 10 years, basically. And uh, I get a good margin of safety and I do think they're going to grow around 20 ish percent. But uh, again, that's where I'd begin to get interested. Anything below that is where I get really interested. All right. So that, that's kind of just like the gist of, of uh, my evaluation on this aspect. So taking a look at ratios, we see the current ratio uh, right here, pretty good. Little solvency ratio is pretty good. Again, no debt on this thing. Uh, I think they just started accumulating some debt and the model's actually porting that in and the annual report's not actually as up to date. Um, so they didn't have any debt at the time of that annual report but now it appears as though they do. Uh, so taking a look at the gross profit margin, uh, it's pretty good, increasing, very solid. One year of terribleness, about 2015, but really solid uh, operating margins. And I bet you, I bet you, this is like something to do with uh, development costs. Uh, operating margin, that profit margin, okay, ROE, RA, uh, ROIC. Okay, this is a quite lumpy sometimes. You know, we have negative years here, but then pretty solid over here. So all these years are pretty good. If they continue this trend, awesome. Earnings quality is pretty good right now. Some years are you know pretty low, like this one, 2013, 2012. 2015 is pretty bad, but other than that, pretty good. No, no, all this is awesome. Uh, it's a good company. It's a really good company. So I think it stands there. Uh, I, that's where I'd stand. And now this is the section of the video where I talk to you guys about the risk. So the risks inherent with this business is that they're heavily reliant on a couple few titles. If one of those titles does flop, that would be very detrimental. So we better hope that Grand Theft Auto never fails. Red Dead Redemption never fails, uh, that they don't have terrible launches. And we know that sometimes these companies can uh, not put their love, sweat, and tears into a title, and that can actually hurt the company. So this also may be an acquisition target of sorts by maybe, I don't know, like a company that's trying to get into video gaming. I'd say Netflix should buy them. I'll just say that right here. Netflix, if you're listening to me, I know I hold sway. I know that you guys watch all my videos, like the CEO, Reed, Reed Hastings. I know you watch every single one of my videos. I'll tell you right now, if you're looking to get in the video game space, nowhere better to look than buying up Take-Two Interactive. Uh, you're buying a company with very little debt, probably a very value-added uh, acquisition to your company. It's already profitable. Um, then you can start uh, milking it. <laughs> I mean, you got take two, you got 2K. Imagine all the people that buy 2K every single year and now they can get it on Netflix, video games uh, streaming, okay? Like, come on, come on, think about it. Think about this. Think about this, Reed Hastings. Bigger picture here. All right, let me know down below if you guys think that's a good idea. And then we, uh, we, at, tweet, uh, read, we at Reed Hastings, okay? But anyways, uh, further risks. I don't really see the consumer as a risk. Video games are kind of like a, I must have, and it's kind of like a one purchase that, you know, some people can make still, even if they're, they're, uh, going through hard times, uh, it's $60 at the end of the day for endless hours of entertainment. Uh, people love their entertainment, especially when they're going through hard times. So 
you know, you, you're kind of investing in escapism. So Grand Theft Auto is a great form of escapism. You talk about the metaverse. Well, Grand Theft Auto kind of is that uh, <laughs> in, in, in a lot of ways. And the newer iterations are probably going to get closer and closer to that. And it's a fantastic title with tons of uh, attention to detail in terms of the video game itself. So, yeah, I, as far as risks go, I say it's the valuation. The valuation is the primary risk. Secondary risk is a concentration of video game titles. Um, other than that, no, that's that's pretty much all the risks that I see with this company. Uh, so let me know down below what you guys think. If you guys are interested in this company, buying it now, waiting for a pullback. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys on the next one.